Welcome, good morning, good afternoon, nearly good evening in some places of the world. I'm very happy to welcome you to our first webinar in uh, 21 and uh, a warm welcome to our speakers and our moderator, Professor Joel Coelho from Arizona University and our vice chair, Emil Bresa from Agriculture and Bak Yang from Cantex. Uh, we will hear a very exciting, or we will have a very exciting um, one and a half hour with them. And <laughs> before I start, I would like to share my screen with you and introduce the AVF, who is the organizer uh, of this webinar. And, um, and thank you also to our co-organizer, Hogan Dorn. So the AVF, I hope you can all see my screen. Vertical farming rising to the next level should be our topic for 21. A lot has happened in this past year, and the AVF, uh, founded 2013, is the leading globally active nonprofit organization to foster a successful implementation for vertical farming, indoor farming. And what we do is we present the topic uh, of vertical farming around the world. We connect uh, and foster cooperation and collaboration but we also initiate projects and build consortia to apply for funding and we gather information and conduct training. These are our members, just a selection. Thank you to all our members, uh, to your dedication to drive forward this topic with us. But we also have our own project since 21 and that's the AVF lab in Munich. So we uh, do experiments, we uh, educate uh, the citizens and we raise awareness on that topic. We do events, the smallest one of that besides webinars are the round tables. The round tables are also a very local um, e event <coughs> format of us to connect all stakeholders uh, in these meetings. We have done a lot of EU funding uh, the last year. Uh, three of the main uh, applications uh, you can see here. That is always uh, in consortia, what, 71 uh, partners across Europe, 20 partners or 15 partners that varies and that is what we also continue for the year 21. We also uh, are part of international funding schemes and we have uh, uh, handed in uh, to the Abu Dhabi Department of Education and Knowledge um, a huge international consortia application for smart and optimized indoor farming as an ecosystem for holistic and sustainable food security in Abu Dhabi. Besides that international funding in Abu Dhabi, uh, we have partnered with Wageningen University in two major uh, applications with uh, Chinese partners and European partners. So AVF is very active uh, in the field of applying for funding for their members. That I think is a huge benefit uh, to join the AVF. But we also have written and will publish end of this week, finally, uh, the state of vertical farming in Europe 2020. All members have free access and will get um, the link end of the week uh, sent to their mailbox. The outlook for 21, we have uh, besides uh, the white paper for North America and Asia, which are prepared now already, 
new funding applications, um, a series of eight webinars. The first is happening now at the moment. And the further development of the ADF lab and training center in Munich. But the highlight will definitely be the International Vertical Farming uh, Conference and Exhibition here in Munich. It will be an in-person and online um, international uh, congress with uh, the in, in partnership with the Bavarian Ministry of Economics and Agriculture. That will happen on September 3rd. So please uh, write it down in your calendar already now. You will get an invitation to this soon. We have built up an indoor farming university network, IFON, and here you can see who already has joined us. And that will be uh, on top of our priority list to um, extend that and to develop that further. The uh, International Vertical Farming Conference 21, I've already uh, talked about it, September uh, two, two, 2 to 3rd, happening with an exhibition and an interesting conference program here. A new, uh, very new project for us and activity is uh, the Vertical Farming Community, a new AVF platform where all parts of the industry, all parts of science and interested uh, people in that field can easily communicate and exchange with each, uh, with each other. It is open now uh, for uh, the non-members uh, as well, and we will um, actively publish and promote that. And we welcome you all to join uh, uh, to join that uh, platform and uh, start that one-stop communication um, for uh, right away. Our AVF uh, board and uh, AVF members uh, are uh, supported since last year by a new appointed AVF advisory board. And we are really thankful to our advisory board members, uh, Ali uh, Ahmedijad from Heliospectra, Louis Suelo from Hogendorn, Kemant Yolka from Vegitech, and Jasper and Weston from Haas University, and Max Lassel from Appolution. They really help us a lot uh, to move AVF forward in the right direction. Thank you. But without our volunteers, uh, AVF wouldn't be where we are. Thank you as well to Peter, Laura, Susanna, Simon, Margaret in the US, Tim in, uh, Kim in, in Malaysia, and Laura here in Germany, Thea in, in the Netherlands, and uh, yeah, thank you to, to all their dedicated work. And thanks to my colleagues, thanks to Joel and Ramin. Um, and uh, we, we are really looking forward to, to bring uh, vertical farming to a new level. And now the mic is to Joel Coelho, who will be our moderator today. Thank you very much. You're mute. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christine, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. Uh, this morning, we're very privileged to be joined by two of the pioneers of precision indoor production of commercial cannabis. And they are here to share with us the crucial lessons that they have learned in the industry, which are fully applicable to vertical farming for food crop production. So we're being joined by Bak Young as well as Emil Breza. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Bak. Uh, he's the director and co-founder of Cantex Life Sciences, uh, which is based in Guelph, Ontario. Bak, please. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to share some insights. Uh, you know, we're, we're always very interested in, in trying to take knowledge that we develop uh, and, and propagate it in industries and, and you know not just the cannabis industries, but related. So we're happy to share some experience that we've had. You know, I'm gonna detail sort of four points that uh, I think are lessons that we can learn from cannabis that may have applications in other crops. Um, some of this is not gonna be necessarily new, but might uh, you know have some greater context uh, working with cannabis. 
you know, I mean, obviously the purpose of vertical farming is to unlock the potential of the third dimension. Um, you know, the advancement of LED technology, be, um, the ability to have arrays as opposed to point source lighting is what really allows you to create a uniform uh, energy density uh, on a planar um, uh, system and be able to produce uh, consistently in a stack production system. Uh, and, you know, if anybody's got some experience working with uh, microgreens or uh, or other, um, you know, vegetative cycle uh, crops and vertical farming, where, you know, you may have a, a three to six inch uh, canopy, if you will. Um, you can get those stacks really tight, and uh, and that certainly unlocks a, a lot of space within the facility. Cannabis is a little bit different. Um, we're talking about a plant that um, needs stature and nodal sites to flowers and secondary metabolites. We're not just growing for biomass. We're actually growing for um, reproductive organs and secondary metabolites. Um, and, um, and so, uh, you know, building some stature on the crop is necessary to, uh, to um, you know, achieve that end. Um, you know, and, and we're also dealing with a, a, a higher intensity uh, cultivation system. So, you know, microgreens, you might be working with, um, I don't know, eight or 10 DLI. Um, you know, cannabis cultivators are growing 40, maybe even as high as 60 DLI. Um, and so as you start to compress the density of your stacks uh, and increase the energy input per unit of uh, canopy, you get into a, a bit of a runaway challenge, an exponential challenge with thermal management. So I think that's the fundamental difference. This is no different than other crops. It's just uh, sort of an order of magnitude, more difficult challenge to deal with uh, because of, of the magnitudes that we're dealing with. Um, you know, so I think that's the first point and, and uh, you know, obviously to that end, you're not growing uh, eight foot cannabis trees in a vertical farming system. This is sort of defeats the whole purpose. Um, and, uh, you know, we've done some work with planting density studies, sort of following trends that you see in other commercial crops uh, around planting density. Uh, and, uh, you know, that facilitates this uh, thermal management uh, and, um, and also making sure that you're capturing all of those photons throughout the crop cycle. Um, you know, we're also dealing with uh, a plant phenology that has both a vegetative and a generative cycle. So as a consequence of that, um, you have very different conditions at those extremes. Um, you know, early on, you might run a, a very humid system, have low evapotranspiration uh, and running relatively warm as you approach the end of the cycle. Uh, and you've got, um, you know, these large flower sites. Um, and because we are cultivating a product that has to undergo microbial testing, you got to you gotta, uh, pull back on the lever, so to speak, dry out uh, and cool down the crop, uh, both to encourage it to finish uh, its generative cycle, uh, but also to mitigate against uh, potential microbial risk. Uh, obviously, growing plant, plants love a, a warm, humid environment, but so do um, certain pernicious microbiota. So you have to have a system that's designed to handle those extremes and edge cases, um, and and that's no mean feat. Um, certain mechanical equipment and the thermodynamics of how it operates um, will it'll be very challenging to operate at, at some of these um, these conditions, like a cool, dry condition uh, with a high sensible load high latent load. Um, you know, the other thing is, is, you know, uh, it, it, the importance I want to highlight is the standardization of inputs. You know, I, I talked about uh, using planting density and a, and a shorter vegetative cycle as a way of keeping the canopy short, facilitating um, uh, breaking up microclimates. Um, you know, the thicker that canopy is to move air through it, it becomes uh, immensely challenging. Uh, and, um, you know, so having a, a shorter veg period um, it means that you can finish that crop with, uh, with less obstruction or resistance to airflow and thermal dissipation. But if you're going to have a very short vegetative cycle, then you need to have very high quality and synchronized inputs. And so, you know, that presents challenges. Uh, cannabis genomes are not, um, this is a crop that has not benefited from 50, 60 years of industrial breeding work. Um, most breeders don't have uh, homozygous parental lines. You are not cultivating cannabis from seed uh, as a consequence of that uh, and the testing requirements and standardization needs. So asexual propagations um, are the solution uh, 
uh, but uh, conventionally propagating, you know, with uh, donor stock and vegetative cuttings um, creates an opportunity cost now. So you, you end up maintaining a huge amount of space in your facility allocated to the maintenance of that donor stock and producing a lot of clones to achieve density. Um, and, uh, you know, that can also, um, you know, factor into, um, you know, the business case over uh, vertical farming. Don't, don't uh, shortchange yourself in terms of propagation space. Um, you know, you really want to achieve planting densities as high as possible. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, I think our best yield metric with cannabis uh, was four plants per square foot and finishing that crop in eight to 12 inches. Um, you know, these perfect little single cola Christmas trees. It's ideal from a processing and handling standpoint. It's ideal from an uh, environmental control standpoint because uh, you don't have as much resistance in the crop, but you need a lot of plantlets uh, to do that. Um, you know, at Cantex, we use uh, tissue culture, micropropagation as a way to uh, mitigate that opportunity cost, uh, you know, because we can just propagate on much less space and energy uh, to achieve that. You know, I also want to talk a bit about um, validation and data. I mean, this is probably not a new concept, uh, but, you know, we've, we've sort of followed a trend in industry for a long time and, and, you know, been encouraged to see a lot of vendors providing technology designed to uh, give cultivators real-time data, uh, a larger data set, um, and, uh, um, and hopefully use some of those insights derived uh, from the to optimize their, their systems. Um, the reality is, is a lot of these products, um, I mean, some of these products are kind of garbage, uh, to be honest, they don't work. Um, you, you don't really know until you try it, um, you know, and something to consider uh, when, with some of these is look for biases, uh, look for potential um, interactions. Um, you know, let me give you a couple examples. Uh, something as simple as a thermometer. Uh, you know, a thermometer, it can be biased by irradiance. Uh, if it's not an aspirated sensor, uh, shielded from, uh, uh, from that irradiance, well, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to bias the reading. And if you're trying to do something like a dew point control uh, on your environmental conditions, even a half degree of bias uh, can result in a runaway dry or humid condition. Uh, so you got to validate any any equipment that you're using. Don't just assume out the box that this equipment works uh, as intended. Let me give you a, a more um, ephemeral example, a little bit harder to figure out. We we were using uh, thermal imaging for um, uh, crop uh, leaf temperature and 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 uh, temperature of the crop. As the trichomes form on the cannabis, they start to reflect lights, uh, ref reflect the incident light. And so what we started to measure was not just the infrared coming off as heat, uh, but also this reflectance. And so that was biasing our, our results. Um, you know, and so validation is the name of the game. Uh, the more time you can spend making sure that all of the data readings you're getting are good, that the conditions are standard, standardized across your productive plane, uh, and independent forms of measurement to confirm a result. Um, the last thing you want to do is look back on six months of data, try to do a trend analysis and find out uh, we, we don't rely on, we can't rely on this data. We've got some, some unintended bias here. Uh, and, uh, and now your set is, is of less utility. So, um, you know, I think, I think those are the things that, uh, you know, have been, um, you know, we've, we've had opportunities to stub our toes. Um, you know, we, we, um, we purchased some vertical farming equipment from vendor uh, that, uh, and we've also done some prototyping work ourselves. Um, to be honest, uh, you know, it, the, we haven't seen with the exception of uh, the approach that Emil will talk about, um, we haven't seen a, a, an approach to vertical farming and cannabis that we think is truly scalable. Uh, the equipment that we purchased, uh, you know, we, we use it in a photobiology lab and as a proving ground, uh, but we know that it's not scalable and in, into uh, a mass production. And then primarily that's attributable to um, lacking both a supply and return uh, plenum that is distributed uh, fully across the growing plane. Um, you know, we did some prototyping work where we did transverse airflow over a 16 foot run. Uh, we got two to five degree uh, variability over that 16 feet and, and two to five RH variability. Um, uh, 
And so, you know, you can imagine if you're trying to scale that up to a 50 foot room, um, that level of variability is, is unacceptable. Uh, and, um, you know, the, I think the real insight when we move to a, a vertical airflow, uh, both a supply and a return plenum, uh, we cut that variability by an order of magnitude. And I think that's really the key here is, um, is you know, airflow management, thermal management, uh, and the energy requirements for producing high order species like cannabis change the, uh, the complexity uh, of, uh, of the vertical farming challenge. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pause there and uh, see if we have uh, some questions. Okay, uh, so we encourage, uh, of course, uh, members of the audience to ask questions and we uh, are allotting ample time at the end of the presentations uh, for you to interact with our speakers. But uh, we have time right now for some quick questions if you have any. Uh, and you may type them either on the chat box or the Q&A box. All right. I don't see anything right now, Bob. So perhaps we can just well, hold off on that. Yes. Sure. <laughs> right. And uh, we can uh, proceed with uh, Emil. And then after that, of course, we're going to have that uh, conversation. Oh, here, here's one uh, from uh, Jurian. Is heat a big problem indoor with a high light intensity for cannabis crops? Yeah, yes, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, so we it, it's it's heat and humidity that we're primarily concerned uh, around. Um, you know, we uh, we tried we we're probably one of the few cannabis operators that seeks to be uh, free of pest and disease. Um, I think for a lot of uh, folks, the assumption is um, you know it's integrated pest management. We're managing the presence of pest and disease. In the context of indoor farming, you can be free of pest and disease. You got to have clean inputs. You got to have great cultural practices. Um, but uh, but even with all of those efforts, um, you know, microbiota are are very pernicious. They can live in the tissues. They can uh, reside in harbor and irrigation systems in HVAC equipment. Uh, and uh, um, you know, so heat you know heat and humidity is is perfect for microbial growth. And as that canopy gets thicker and thicker, uh, airflow um, becomes um, less and less effective as a means to wick away that heat. Um, and so you either need a very distributed and high velocity, but not too high velocity, or you'll disrupt the boundary layer on that leaf and, and, and desiccate your plants. Um, uh, but uh, um, you know that, that challenge is, is very real, and the impact of it is uh, product that is non-conforming to microbial standards, things like bud rot. Uh, you might get, you know, a bad powdery mildew. Uh, you know, these are, I mean, as I said before, cannabis crops are not robust genomes. Um, you know, they're, we've not bred for disease resistance. We've been breeding for THC for 20 years. Um, you, you know, and as a consequence of that, um, uh, these are very vulnerable. Um, so yeah, yes, it, 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 that's the fundamental challenge. And, and you can't spend enough time thinking through uh, the thermodynamics of, of how you mitigate that. Okay, we have two quick questions here. One from Chris Nightingale. What would you use as a target relative humidity? And the other one is, uh, do you use different light spectra for different stages? Uh, both good questions. Uh, I'll, uh, is, uh, is an interesting one. Uh, really, I think what we're looking at is the target PD, uh, you know, and, and that target changes uh, along the uh, life cycle of the crop. You know, early on, we typically running more humid uh, we're, um, and, uh, and higher temperatures. Uh, as the cycle uh, changes, we will lower the temperature and lower the humidity. End of cycle, you really want to, uh, you, you know, try to be hitting 50 RH. Uh, and, and not exceeding that uh, because that's that, you know, 50 RH. And again, this is like, where is the sensor? How uniform is your room? Um, you know, in some context, a 50 RH might be very different at wherever your control box is versus what's in your canopy. Uh, so, you know, if, if you've got some microclimates, be aware of that. Your reading might be 50, but your crop might be 75. 
Um, uh, you know, but so I would be targeting VPDs and, uh, and there's good resources on the web uh, in terms of VPD targets for, you know, um, vegetative, early generative, late generative cycles. Uh, take them with a grain of salt and make sure that you're looking at leaf temperature, not ambient air temperature, um, because you can uh, often exceed a, um, a, uh, a safe VPD target. Um, you, you know, what will happen is if your leaf temperature delta, the difference between leaf temperature and your ambient air, if that starts to decline, you've exceeded the homeostatic capacity of your plants and they are shutting down transpiration to try to hold on to water. Uh, and you can kind of get a runaway heat situation. You need to make sure that your plants are breathing, that they are, are uh, transpiring water, that they're, they're wicking away heat and maintaining a two degree C uh, leaf temperature delta uh, during a lights on. Um, you know, and, and that's another, actually, if you take a moment on that, it's, it's also something to consider is your transition from day to night cycle. Um, you know, you've got a leaf temperature that, is, that uh, you know, depending on what your uh, humidity set points are, you might hit a dew point on your leaf when you go from daytime to nighttime. Temperature differential, it, it will increase. We've seen it as high as four or five degrees C um, at night when the lights are off, uh, but the plants are still transpiring. The second question was about uh, spectrum. Um, in generative, uh, we've probably worked with two dozen different lighting fixtures. Our working hypothesis, I don't want to call it a conclusion, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Our working hypothesis is that a broad spectrum uh, high output fixture with good uniformity is uh, probably the way to go. Um, spectral customization, multi-channel fixtures, um, they might have some applications in certain crop species. Um, we do think that there's value at different life cycles of so clones and donor stock. Uh, we don't want any UV on our donor stock because that could induce mutations. Um, you know, there are some, some uh, spectrum in the early uh, uh, stages of propagations where, you know, we've seen weird effects like hermaphrodism be induced by uh, some, some narrow spectrum um, emissions. But generally, more light, bro more broad spectrum light is better, and I think that's a better use of dollars than trying to get a multi, um, you know, the, the customization, I think you have to understand what you need first before you wanna spend that kind of money. It, it substantially drives up the cost of a fixture to, to be able to tune that fixture. And you're just paying for a lot of hardware that typically you're not using. Um, but, um, but again, I, I will say that as a working hypothesis, I know there's some good work out there that um, would suggest there's potential in, in customization. I just wouldn't know what, what spectrum to, to recommend. And frankly, there's probably pretty big phenotypic differences. Um, so it may not be a one size fits all. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna ask one more question. The others, we will uh, address those during the Q&A period. Uh, this is from Zachary, he says, I apologize, but are you saying that HVAC energy and humidity is a challenge that is not possible to effectively manage or is it prohibitively expensive? Uh, no, it is, it can be done. And uh, Emil is gonna tell you all about it. Um, so you're, if you're interested in, Figuring out the solution to that, um, you know, we we are, we fully endorse the approach that Emil's taking. It is revolution. I'm I'm going to pump his tires a bit. Um, this is a really well thought out design. Um, you know, ex experimentally validated, computational fluid dynamics validated. Um, you, you know, and it and it's uh, you know the other aspect is um, you know this is a system that has been designed for commercial production. So usability is an important part of that as well. So. Um, you, you know, I think you're, you're going to be very excited to hear the next presentation. Right. And with that, I think that's the perfect segue to uh, move into the presentation of our second uh, distinguished speaker, Emil Brezza. He is the president of Agriculture Advancements uh, based uh, around the Niagara Peninsula area. So Emil, uh, your expertise and forte is on airflow management, uh, among other things. And so I think uh, you can address uh, one of these questions that was just recently asked. Um, thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, Joel. Thanks for the introductions. Um, yeah, so um, I, I think maybe it might be better to just, because uh, it really, uh, the question is poignant to the presentation and maybe uh, we just jump right in. Uh, some of your questions may be answered as I go through the slides. Uh, and if not, of course, um, I'd be more than happy to answer direct questions afterwards. So 
Uh, let me get my uh, presentation up here. So um, our presentation is growing higher order plants in uh, vertical farm setting uh, as it pertains to uh, air management and some of the uh, HVAC uh, questions. And uh, so what do plants need? Um, they need, of course, uh, photons, nutrients, temperature, humidity, uh, uh, an elevated dose of CO2 if you're trying to grow at, um, at uh, uh, higher rates. And of course, the big thing here is the removal of waste uh, that is produced through respiration, transpiration, and heating lights. So uh, we at Agriculture, we use a, 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 an approach that we call plant first. Um, and so literally when we uh, do our designs, we, we start at the plant and move outwards. And what are you trying to bring in and what do you need to control and what do you need to get out? So um, the, um, the uh, highlighted uh, bullets there are uh, things that um, are either overlooked uh, or underappreciated. And of course, uh, ascending direction of airflow, um, leaf temperature lower than the canopy temperature. If you want to uh, ensure good VPD, you want to make sure that the plant is transpiring and is cooling the leaves. Um, you want to minimize the amount of airflow over open substrate. Uh, that's going to add to your HVAC loads, and that's kind of poignant uh, down uh, down the road. And of course, um, then you want to ensure, as Buck said, equal air supply down the entire length of the grow bed. And uh, one of the last things, of course, for us that, that we always do is uh, check your design uh, using CFD type tools. So. One of the most important things, of course, is uh, BPD. And um, so BPD is essentially the saturated vapor pressure of the leaf at a, at a given temperature, minus the partial vapor pressure uh, of the ambient air or the canopy air at temperature and relative humidity. And that is what uh, you're, you're measuring when you measure BPD. And you'll note that um, it, it, all, um, it all ties together. Um, the plant nutrients are, are brought up uh, with proper control of, of VPD. You get good transpiration. Uh, the roots start to pull the nutrients that you're feeding with the irrigation system. And then, of course, the moisture is transpired. And that's what creates the capillary action through the plant and creates that, um, that steady flow of moisture into the uh, space that you then have to control. And uh, it's all about uh, looking at what's happening in this boundary layer down here. Um, you want, uh, you don't want that very thick and stagnant and that just uh, overloads the plant. And uh, so it's really important that you, you manage that. So uh, boundary layer control, um, you know, ascending airflow, of course, is, uh, is very effective at that. Um, you can, um, you can tune your HVAC system uh, more readily with when you have a very uh, nice thin boundary layer. Um, as Buck mentioned earlier, you want good velocity, but not too much velocity. You don't want to reverse that. So you start to desiccate the plants uh, with flow. And um, you can see that uh, things are connected together. You'll, it'll be a repeating theme here that um, you've got various resistances that the plant needs to overcome uh, starting uh, internally. Um, then stomatal resistance, the leaf boundary layer, and then the atmospheric conditions. And so it, you know, outside plants have to deal with changing barometric pressures and whatnot. Uh, inside grow, that's kind of neutralized and it's a little more steady state. So what's really interesting here is that if uh, there's an analogy to be had, uh, if you look at all the resistances in a plant uh, and you add them up, uh, and you can make a very uh, 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 easy uh, uh, voltage resistance and current in an electrical flow. So it's all about potential differences. And uh, this forms part of the soil plant air continuum. You've got uh, the, um, the lowest uh, pressure or lowest um, force at the top uh, at atmosphere, and you have the highest 
uh, water pressure uh, at the bottom of the soil. And so it wants to naturally flow. And these uh, variables here um, that have the arrows through them are almost like a variable resistor. Uh, they can be tuned somewhat and with a well um, uh, thought out system with the right uh, controllability in it, you can actually control some of those variables more than you would have thought. So at, at, the, at the end of it all, uh, VPD is, uh, it would, the analogy would be VPD uh, is the uh, total resistance times the um, uh, transpiration evaporation rate. And that's the same as voltage times resistance and current. The, uh, the one thing I like to point out here with this slide is that uh, you want to really really limit the amount of horizontal airflow. And you want to, uh, if you have any, you want to make sure it's not too fast. Um, because, uh, and, and, and this will be uh, shown later on down um, uh, in some of the uh, slides, I'll show an active AVI where um, if you, the uh, an HVAC system that's even out of, um, out of capacity by two or 3%, uh, it is astounding what the dynamics uh, can result from that. And this horizontal airflow on open substrate, uh, most people will not account for that in their loads on the HVAC system, but, but that moisture is going someplace. So first off, you're overloading your HVAC system uh, un unexpectedly uh, if you haven't planned for it. And then two, um, you're stressing the plant out. Uh, you're starting, if you have too much airflow there, you can start to desiccate the plants. And so we, we design our system with vertical airflow. And in fact, um, with working with Buck and his team, um, you know, we've come up with specific nozzle designs where uh, the airflow starts quite high here so that young plants don't even get a lot of airflow at all. They grow into the airflow, which is um, you know, great insight from, from Buck's team. And uh, we've, of course, uh, incorporated that into uh, our designs. Um, you know, the benefits of, um, of uh, sending airflow, um, tight, tight control. Um, you, you don't desiccate the plant sideways. You don't get the extra um, evaporation from open uh, substrate. You get the benefit of active cool of the lights without actually having fans, uh, lights that have fans in them. And you reduce that failure mode because you're supplying such um, controlled air in and out. And the, and the air out is right above the lights. It's like having lights with fans. Um, and then of course, when you look at, uh, in, include a well thought out hydronic uh, form of, of uh, HVAC, um, you can do some really interesting things at the, uh, at the end of the system. You can capture heat and you can control uh, a lot better hydronically because you can, you can control independently. So if you want to focus on temperature, uh, independent of the moisture removal, you can do that and you can do the reverse. You can emphasize moisture removal while keeping temperature constant. And then you have the ability to actually um, capture waste heat of lights and use those to uh, offset HVAC loads. So there's a lot of complexity going on here and, and the presentation here wasn't so much on, on HVAC, but just to understand what's happening there. And of course, um, you can see here on the right-hand side in that bubble, um, the nozzles are up high, they're above the strata, there's no um, evaporation of, of the um, substrate, and you, the airflow is pushed through the canopy and then mixes with humidity and then pulled out right at the top of the lights to capture heat of the lights and the humidity, and the cycle just continues. So calculating DPD, I think somebody had a, a question related to this. Um, and as Buck mentioned, uh, you know, you want to have a delta in temperature. Um, a lot of people um, focus on DPD, but only look at one uh, one aspect where temperature and and the uh, ambient air are the same. But if you're not accounting, uh, you need to account for a differential, and you want to see a differential. If you're not seeing one, your plants are probably not transpiring in a healthy fashion. Um, and so, in this example, uh, I'm showing that. Uh, you can, if you have a target temperature of uh, 27 uh, degrees in the canopy and you're expecting a two degree differential for good transpiration, you're actually looking at the 25 degree temperature range. You're not looking at 27 and whatever humidity you're trying to uh, maintain. 
And so you can see here that with uh, some healthy transpiration, um, you know, you're stressing the plant a little bit, but depending upon what stage of growth you're at, uh, this value is still within range and acceptable. Um, if you look at the right-hand side here, um, if you're not accounting for the delta and your leaf temperature is the same, or you've designed your system for zero difference, look at the difference in stress that the plant is gonna experience. Um, and so now you're clearly in an unhealthy type of transpiration uh, rate and you're gonna have problems. Uh, you're gonna see it in the, in the way your plants are growing. And just as an aside, if, if in this example, uh, we were maintaining a minus three uh, delta, this value would be down somewhere around 1.2, like right on the transition between um, healthy, like the green zone and the orange zone. So um, being having agency to affect this is, uh, is critical. And then of course, all of that, uh, VPD, airflow, movement, temperature, all at the end of the day comes in and um, helps you able to determine what is the expected uh, moisture production rate that your HVAC system is gonna have to come over. Now, there are some other variables that do get added to this, but this kind of gives you an idea uh, how to size and what you, what you can expect. Um, you know, you have to understand what the stomatal conductance is, and um, some of this information is not readily available. Uh, we are actually engaged in trying to map some of this out some more, but it's very helpful nonetheless. So again, uh, you're looking at healthy transpiration. You want a minus two delta. Uh, then you look at, at, once you've established that, you're looking at the leaf saturated vapor pressure, the air uh, partial pressure, and then the VPD rate. And then there's a really fancy uh, formula that you have to integrate into this. And you come up with um, a, a net value of moisture removal in uh, liters per, uh, per hour per meter squared. So that's how it all ties together. And of course, you can see here as the stomatal conductance changes, if you have different uh, values here, if the genetics um, give you different values here, you'll see how your moisture production rate can change. And so you need to have an HVAC system that can handle some flexibility there. So um, once you've established those variables that you're trying to control, you've got uh, air that you're managing. Now you have to ensure that um, you're, uh, you're having equal airflow down the entire length of a grow bed. And as Buck said, um, once you start to scale up, you start to increase that length, things get really complicated. And um, if you have a very short grow bed, you know, eight feet to 12 feet, um, not as difficult to control, but when you're at 48 feet, things get um, a lot more difficult. You start to get into a lot of fluid dynamic issues. Um, there are, you know, when you're trying to size a system, you've got a plant of a certain size, you want so many plants in there. Um, you've only got so much space to get ducks in and, and return ducks the air back out, you get limits on velocity and on flow rates just simply because of the cross-sectional areas and the volumes you have to work with. Having said all that, um, you, you do have ability to, uh, to make changes. You can design your nozzles and your distribution system where they are uh, adjustable. And with that, you can balance or tune um, the way the air flows down uh, a, a grow bed. And the other thing you have to be cognizant of is that as air moves through any uh, duct, you're going to uh, create back pressure. It's just uh, the physics of airflow. And you need to account for that when you're sizing your, your system. You got to make sure that your you're putting in uh, can overcome all of the resistances throughout. And if you remember the slide up above where you know, inside your air handling unit, you've got a, a whole nother ton of, of uh, resistances that you need to overcome. And so you need to uh, design and accommodate for all of those resistances and then balance everything. So this is an example of, you know, at the top here, um, if, you, if you have an unbalanced flow, you'll see you have big discrepancies in the velocities coming out of those no nozzles. And so you're gonna have different temperatures, uh, potentially different humidities and air flows. You're going to have boundary layer changes down, uh, down the line. And this is even with um, supplying at the bottom and returning the top, um, which is far better than um, doing it from a transverse perspective. Then when you do a balancing exercise, you can see how you can smooth out 
uh, that airflow and you can ensure that most nozzles are getting within a tight range of the velocities that you want to see coming out of there. So um, now uh, comes uh, the examples. So this, is, this was a cloning room uh, where we did analysis for a, for a customer. They were experiencing problems um, in some of these cells and they, they didn't understand why uh, some of their um, plants and some of the um, chambers here were dying. Now, these are open, um, open chambers. Uh, the room was supposed to be kept at uh, a high enough uh, humidity where um, it wasn't gonna be a problem but the HVAC system was designed just ever so slightly undersized. And um, you can now see what kind of problems you can um, experience with a two to 3% shortfall in HVAC capacity. This is what can happen. So in hindsight now, it's quite easy to see what, what their problem was. The way they designed their supply registers uh, lined up exactly with the open corners on some of these chambers. The shortfall in uh, HVAC capacity eventually created a, um, a high pressure area up above, and it literally pushed the throw of air down right into the open cell chambers. Now you're talking young plants, they just got um, uh, cloned. And they can't handle that type of disruption. So they got high velocity and cold air dumped right on them. And of course, those are the ones that were having the, the, but they were looking at all kinds of other problems. They were thinking it's the chambers and you're, you know, you're chasing red herrings. If you don't, if you don't bother to do a, an analysis and understand what's happening in your room, you may never find the problem effectively. Like, and it just, it just con continues on the same way. So in, in theory, the design was okay. They, they, they undersized their um, um, HVAC system and should have probably um, made sure that the uh, flows uh, just went up on the outside edges of the walls and they got pulled up through the middle. So there could have been some other uh, design insights, but um, you know, on the surface, it, it all looked okay. Oh, sorry. And then we're gonna look at uh, an actual grow room example. So this, uh, this example is what uh, we call bulk air distribution. So you have massive air handlers on the outside here. In this case, it was a DX type system where um, they're not using hydronic control. So they, there's limited agency to make any adjustments there as well. Um, those air handlers are uh, just outside here on top of this mezzanine and they, um, enter the air through these registers that um, blow down and make a 90 degree turn and come straight into the grow room. Then inside that grow room, um, there's a series of plenums on the front of the, uh, the, the grow beds uh, that are captured that bulk air and then attempt to redistribute it with some um, um, duct stocks. Uh, they, these weren't um, hard uh, type of connections through the um, the inner canopy and the upper, um, uh, the upper canopy. And their approach was uh, to initially try and just blow that air out, especially around the lights. Um, and then they have two massive returns uh, high up uh, at the far wall that the, the design intent was to pull that air back out through the canopy and capture all the um, uh, hot air and humidity um, near the ceiling. And this shows the distribution of the um, sock ducts over top of the lights. The idea is to keep the lights cool and blow the heat uh, of photon generation out. And uh, of course, um, this is what happened. And, and you can see there's, uh, there's a lot of, lot of things going on here. And there's a lot of in interactions, but one of the first things I'll point out um, and, and you know, it's no like it's hard to predict these things if you don't model them, but the, the exact elevation of the entry registers in relation to the restricted um, area of the grow bed, because the plenum and the, and the table was creating um, essentially a, a venturi tube or a carburetor. And so this high velocity air hitting this first layer here created low pressure right above and was pulling the air back out of the canopy. 
Um, but what you can also see here is that, of course, with um, without pulling the air right out of the canopy as it's being created, um, the distribution um, uh, was not um, was not even, and you had that problem. This was a 32 foot row bed, and you'd be able to see that the um, amount of air coming out diminished as you go down the line, and um, that was. Uh, to, we were able to see that uh, through this analysis as well. And the problem is it just gets worse and worse. Um, as the red builds, um, that's because their HVAC system was also on top of all this undersized. So they had the right airflow, um, but only coming out of two registers, impinging on a restriction, creating a Bernoulli effect or a carburetor, pulling the actual air the, as you're the cooling air that you're trying to pick up on the outside is being removed and uh, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And the heat of the lights uh, can't go anywhere. And the two uh, returns that were up at the top weren't um, um, distributed enough and sized enough to actually pull uh, all of the heat and humidity in that room back out. And it just creates a, a, a runaway effect here. Uh, from our uh, calculations and this um, CFD, some of the air temperatures up, uh, uh, up here were over 40 degrees C. And so that means your root zone was 40 degrees C, which is you know, a danger zone for any plant. So it's unlikely that the plants up here <coughs> were, um, were gonna produce it, uh, most likely to die. Now, we were approached uh, before this room went live but after it got built. Uh, ideally, when you wanna do this is at the upfront stage and um, relative to the cost of building your facility in these rooms, a CFD model is, uh, is really um, very inexpensive. If you're looking at the millions and millions of dollars you're about to invest in building out your facility um, to spend the kind of money uh, that it costs to get the answers to this, um, it would be foolish to, to not do it but it's surprising how many people don't do it. And these techniques have been around for, uh, for quite a long time, um, but they're just not really used. And then, oops, sorry. This is um, the same simulation, but looking at humidity and it's kind of the inverse problem. Um, so, you know, you can see that the only reason that the humidity, even though the HVAC system was undersized. The only reason that the humidity looks okay here is because the temperature was out of control here, uh, and that high temperature um, was uh, was changing the uh, the RH values to what looks like an acceptable level. But in reality, it's so unbalanced. You have um, you have runaway temperature. You have decent humidity here, and then at the lower levels, um, you can see that the supply is actually not keeping up with the design intent. It was supposed to be somewhere uh, around 60 to 65. And of course, um, the HVAC system was uh, not sized correctly. And you can see how everything is still being pulled out of the canopy. So in, in this case, the only layer that was likely to um, could be successful was the first layer here. Um, so it didn't have excessive velocities and um, it would have had decent um, enough humidity and temperature being pulled into the canopy by this fan down here. Um, this layer would have been okay, but the velocities were so high that the first third of the plants here um, when they first went in either would be blown over or would be desiccated just because of the intense velocities. And um, this is, uh, you know, um, what uh, what we propose as a as a solution. Um, again, uh, and and this is scalable. Um, this is showing a five cell version, but uh, this would be just as effective in a ten cell or an eleven cell, twelve cell version. Um, we're pretty comfortable um, supplying up to about forty eight feet. Um, 
we understand the dynamics with that. And here you can, you can really see the um, elevated nozzles, um, the distributed irrigation system tucked out of the way. Uh, it allows easy access to the plants. These plants are um, in trays. Uh, they're using the same type of slabs used in greenhouses. You can, you can pull these trays out to work on the plants outside of the canopy. You don't have to reach in. Um, treated air is the uh, purple here. It's being supplied at set point temperature, velocity, uh, humidity, and mixing with the byproducts of um, uh, photosynthesis, and uh, then mixing with the uh, air, um, the light, the heat of the lights, and being pulled out right above the lights, and then brought back to the front of the row where um, it's treated once again, and then reintroduced. And that's, uh, that's all I have for the presentation. It's uh, supposed to be just an overview. Um, I will be adding uh, Buck's contact information here as well. Um, or Buck, you can, you can give it out now and I can add this uh, to it and then send out a PDF to the ABF with your contact details. Sure. Uh, Thank if, you, Emil. <laughs> sorry, if, if, uh, for, if anybody would like uh, my contact, it's buck.young. C-A-N-N-T-X dot com. All right. Okay. So now we have time for a Q&A, but I'd like well, to uh, ask the first question to, uh, to Emil. So Emil, I think the analysis and the design that uh, you came up with are really sound. Uh, that's really great. Uh, and, and I like the fact that you uh, correlated your uh, recommended Delta T uh, between the leaf temperature and ambient temperature with vapor pressure deficit and temperature and relative humidity and that translates into healthy transpiration and that ascending airflow really uh, makes uh, it very consistent uh, throughout the uh, production uh, chamber but my question is have you and, and even Bach have you too had a chance to directly correlate the healthy transpiration that you have achieved with the growth rate the desired flower architecture and the consistent and desired levels of THC and other cannabinoids in, in uh, cannabis. Emil, uh, 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 <laughs> hand it over to you there. <laughs> thing. Um, you know, I, I just want to pick up on a point that Emil made uh, sort of gently, but uh, I just want to hammer this home. The reality is, is that all of these things are connected. You know, the the uh, the RH and temperature and, and the leaf temp, uh, giving you your vapor pressure deficit. Your vapor pressure deficit has to be correlated to the amount of nutrition you're providing. If you have poor ET, well, then your immobile nutrients you're going to be deficient on. If you have high ET, your high immobile nutrients will, will build up in excess and create osmotic stresses. Um, they're all in connect the gases that you're using and the light intensity. You have to balance all of these things. This is what I think the, the cannabis industry really struggles to get over. Uh, the legacy mentality is I've got my schedule, I've got my set points, that's what I'm running versus a biofeedback model, which is you know trying to integrate all of these things. And, and when you make one change in one parameter, mm -hmm. that's everything else that you're doing. Um, yeah. And so this is why it's called to provide recommendations over specifics. And, and we encourage folks to take a data-driven approach. Um, you know, we do things, um, you know, measure the SAP EC uh, as well as the root zone EC and look at the delta between those, compare that to our ET and our VPD and our leaf temp to know, like, do, are we building, are we accumulating excess salts? Are we deficient on it, on mobile nutrients? Um, it's, it's just not a one size fits all. And even within a particular germplasm, the nature of that germplasm might change. Are you dealing with a potential endophyte? that could be affecting plant transport through the vascular tissues. Um, you may need to pull back on your VPD target if your plants are dealing with uh, an endophytic bacterium or fungi. Um, you know, it is, it, you know, the, I just wanna reinforce the flexibility. You have to assume that you're gonna be dealing with a lot of variability. We're dealing with biological systems. We're dealing with high intensities in with biological systems. And as a result of that, you have a lot of variability to deal with. If you under-engineer your system, and as Emil says, you just, just cross a threshold of, of under capacity, um, the conditions get exponentially worse. 
um, you know, so the, the flexibility of the system to allow you to tailor, mm -hmm. the, probably not able to hand you here, just turn key, you, you know, you don't have to figure anything out. You got to take that data driven approach, look for the biofeedback, make the adjustments. Um, and, uh, um, you know, because things like excess salt buildups, we've seen delay maturation of a crop uh, from essentially running too high VPDs. Um, we've seen uh, two low VPDs have uh, critical ion deficiencies that uh, are necessary for secondary metabolite production. Even the structure as the architecture, as you say, Joel, of the plant, um, you know, if you, if you take a very conservative approach and you see this with a lot of greenhouse cannabis production, um, you know, you take a conservative approach, you don't try to push your DLIs, you're not trying to run intense conditions. You just get flat that are not bulked up, they're, you know, they're loose bud structure. They're not what the consumer wants. Um, you know, we are, as an industry, trying to produce a, the, in very extreme, very extreme conditions. And as you approach that efficiency frontier, your margin for error gets smaller and smaller. And so that's why the, the precision of your uniformity across an entire module is key. And, and I just want to hit this insight again. Um, the, you know, Emil talked about direct expansion, HVAC. It is entirely inappropriate for uh, vertical farming systems. When hey, Buck, I, I was trying not to slag a lot of other guys' uh, equipment, but well, just I, I was trying to be gentle there. Um, but definitely a hydronic approach is, uh, is the way to go. And, and distribute it. So a hydronic, the, the DX uh, kicks on and kicks off. It's a compressor-based system. When it hits sat satisfies set point, it turns off. You know, there are variable flow refrigerant systems that ameliorate that to some degree, but I just don't think anything is as good as a hydronic system. You've got a, a cold no, loop. And, Go ahead. And, and, and I was just, just to add to that, the other problem with a DX-based system is that your, uh, your coil physics are set. Um, your um, your SHR, your uh, ratio, so the amount of sensible heat reduction and um, latent heat reduction is set. You can't you can't change it. Uh, you have to then add um, dehumidifiers and reheat into the room if you want to change temperature and humidity and affect that DPD. And then, you know, people look at the upfront costs, but you need to look at operating costs, the ability to make changes that have big impact on profitability and don't just look at the upfront cost of things. You have to factor it all in. And, and the usability. I mean, the, the, yeah. the, if you've got a bunch of ducting and you've got, you know, um, uh, heat uh, uh, economizers on DX systems, like those are biosecurity risks. That's harborage. You got to clean those ducts, you get something in there. Um, you know, it's much easier to move heat in a liquid with a higher specific heat capacity than it is in air less velocity, uh, like it's just, there's, there's no question in my mind that you need a hydronic system with dew point controls and not a centralized system, a distributed right. system so that you can, you can balance each layer, each module, uh, to, because you know, as you're at that, right at that efficiency frontier, if you just cross that a little bit because you're a half degree or one degree warmer in some portion of your plane, you'll toast the crop in that section. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think from the modeling that you showed there, uh, even a centralized hydronic system that would be dumping conditioned air into a space that then gets picked up and distributed, it's, it's not effective. Uh, and uh, and uh, having to have a crazy amount of horsepower uh, just to make sure that runaway conditions. Okay. So, so Bob, before I go to the, uh, the questions from the audience again, I just want, I guess we're looking for confirmation from you in terms of implementing that precision uh, approach that Emil has described uh, in terms of achieving that healthy transpiration rate. Does that in any way correlate with uh, the healthy growth rate and you know, desired architecture Absolutely. of the flower Absolutely. as well as THC levels? A absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, th getting this precision control will shave days off the crop cycle, um, will increase secondary metabolite production. You'll have uh, a denser, uh, more attractive aesthetic in the flower. I mean, we're talking about flowers. These are objects of beauty as much as they are uh, in, uh, about a, you know, uh, catching a buzz. <laughs> so, you know, and, and that matters to the consumer. And, and I, you know, I, I hammer this home. Even the coloration of your product is a function of your ability to that environment. Right. Yeah. There's so much plasticity in this genome. Um, you know, you could take a strain and, and it'll grow, you know, uh, 
you can double your yield and double your potency by just balancing your system out. You know, there were a lot of germplasm that we ran in, uh, in a high pressure sodium setup uh, uh, that, um, you know, that wasn't necessarily optimized in our early days. And we thought, yeah. well, this germplasm just doesn't have the genetic potential. Yeah. You get it in the right environment, you get all those, those life stages lined up uh, and you build that momentum uh, of energy production and synthes um, metabolite synthesis. Uh, it, it, the, it's remarkable the differences in outcomes just as a function of, of paying attention to right. these small right. And I just wanna underscore the point that's all that, that you have shown us today, that directly translates into vertical farming for food crop production. Absolutely. Because going forward, Absolutely. vertical farming is not just about biomass production like Bob has uh, mentioned, but, that, but now consumers are really looking into the flavor profile, uh, the uh, nutrient profile, even the aroma profile, and all of those could really be achieved and optimized and enhanced uh, through this precision uh, type of uh, regulation of the environment. So what you have, uh, you know, designed for, uh, you know, production of uh, THC from cannabis, uh, that same principle really directly translates into vertical farming for food crop production. So there's a lot to that. Yeah. Well, and just probably a little more important when you're talking of the higher order plants, things that have a flower and has fruit uh, right. will be right. more influenced by the precision aspect of it. Your basic uh, vegetative type growth products, you know, you can, you can still get benefit. But you have to weigh the cost versus the benefit. Correct. Correct. Yes. So now let's go back to our uh, members of the audience here. Uh, this is from Philippe. Um, would you have, or would you recommend LED with fixed spectra, but of different types? So different spectra, I suppose, according to growth stage, uh, less hardware and customization, better than single broad range uh, spectrum, light outputs all over. I guess that goes to you, Bob. Well, actually, I, I think we're going to so that just because uh, you've done some work there you know, and uh, there are some very specific use cases that I think um, our industry should be aware of. So you know, maybe you could talk about the work that you've uh, done with Rock. Sorry, Buck, I, um, I, I struggled. I didn't hear you there properly. Oh, sorry. I was just saying, I, I wondered if you wanted to talk about the work that you've done uh, with UV. And um, oh, um, Yeah, sure. Uh, so we, we do incorporate, um, uh, we've designed uh, fixtures that have um, multiple channels, uh, up, up to four and down to two. Um, and so, but as Buck said, on the visible side, uh, we have the agency have two channels, uh, a broad spectrum, cool white, 5700K, uh, plus a deep red 616 nanometer pop that you can use uh, to boost specific uh, aspects and different stages of growth. That can only be put on to one channel. As Buck said, keep it simple. You don't need to uh, differentiate and you can just dim as required. Um, UV is a little bit more finicky. Um, there are some real strategies around UV, especially when you've got UVA and UVB. Um, the UVA that is up near the visible spectrum, you can you can kind of forget about a little bit. It, it's very effective and useful uh, for terpene development and and other uh, secondaries, uh, aromas, uh, some some taste profile. Um, does very little to really stimulate um, um, deep secondary metabolites. So in a in a cannabis plant, uh, UVA won't be helping you much on your THC. It has other useful uh, benefits. UVB is where you really need to have it on a separate channel uh, because it's uh, vitally important to know when to run it, how to run it, and at what power level you want to run it. And as Buck said, if you get that wrong, um, you can get hermaphrodism, you can get uh, scorched plants, you can get some things not going your way, and you're going to get benefit, uh, not the benefits you thought you could have some problems. But when done right, um, the, the, the difference is incredible. And literally, um, I liken it to um, the ability to create um, the same differentiation, for instance, with wine. Uh, Cabernet grown in the Bordeaux region of France commands the dollars it does because it's there and it has a very unique microclimate. Um, Cabernet grown um, in other places of the world it still tastes like a cab, but no one's going to pay those dollars because it's just not the same. And you can, you have the agency here to create that 
unique um, aura around your product if you uh, use light effectively like that. And, uh, and UV is one of those areas where um, it's early days, but uh, it's clear that it has an outsized impact. Okay. And that uh, the qual a question. Oh, sorry. That the uh, the use of UV would be a qualification to my prior statement that um, uh, generally broad spectrum more light is better. That's the one instance where I think there's good uh, empirical evidence uh, in cannabis for secondary metabolite production. Follow up from Philippe. Uh, could you inform lighting feedback with measurement of evapotranspiration, vapor pressure uh, deficit, et cetera? I suppose um, what he's asking uh, is, if, can you adjust your lighting based on measurements of ET, BPD, and so on and so forth? Uh, I, I think it can even get more uh, detailed than that. You can look at CO2 level, uh, CO2 uptake, and the temperature. Um, you know, um, you can, it's, uh, studies show that if you elevate uh, and change the PP, uh, PPFD level of your lights, um, you can get more photosynthesis if you up the temperature. And then you can reach a whole new band where your photosynthetic rate increases. Again, uh, you need to adjust your light level to give the plant what it's looking for. If you're turbocharging the CO2, the temperature, and the light, and then um, this is where uh, watch experience will come in. Uh, you need to adjust for the nutrient uptake at the same rate. And Buck, I'm sure you've got some insight on that. That's a little bit yes. of my pay grade there. Uh, root zone management, actually, this is a good point. You know, when we're talking about these longer crop cycles, um, you know, if you've got a 30 day lettuce or something, um, you're probably not gonna see an accumulation of salts or, or uh, other waste products, uh, that, you know, maybe things like sodium that's used in chelates for micronutrients. There, you probably just don't have enough time in the irrigation events uh, and transpiration to start to see accumulations. When you're dealing with a longer crop cycle, like cannabis and higher transpiration rates, you know, these, these small impurities like sodium, um, you know, if you're not monitoring your root zone, they can accumulate and, and create phytotoxic effects for plants. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, certainly like you have to, this is this, this whole integrated approach, it, you know, the soil, air, uh, light, um, you, you know, you have to balance all these factors so we do things like measure water content, uh, understand that many of the water content um, equipment out there is nonlinear, particularly at the extreme ranges or at high, high and low ETs um, because they operate on a uh, conductance principle and there's a, essentially an inherent bias built into that. There are some other approaches that are more precise than um, using electroconductivity to determine water content. Um, you also get stratification in the media itself. So if you've got a high uh, wind speed over the top of your growing media, you're going to dry out that section and create a dead zone where there is no rooting at the top of your, your media. Um, it's just, it's, it's too uh, alkaline or saline to support plant growth and the plant will just not use that portion of your media. And that's media that you've paid for. Um, you, um, you know, so the, the measuring leachate water content pH in your cubes, um, this is something that we put real time monitoring of pH in the cubes. Unfortunately, the equipment requires a lot of calibration and maintenance. Um, it was useful to understand the dynamics in our root zone uh, and make adjustments so that we could mitigate against this sort of EC stratification in the cubes, cover our cubes. Um, but, you know, we've sort of moved back to uh, manual testing. Some of this this equipment is really useful as to zoom in and understand how your setup is working and tune it. Uh, but it's a lot of work to maintain some of these uh, real-time systems until we find um, some better, better. All right. Products. All right. So uh, I think it is 9, 10, 11, 15, your time. We have quite a few questions. We'd like to address all of them. So if I could suggest, let's uh, keep the answers concise, please. Uh, so here's an economic question from Jurian. With the current production costs of cannabis indoor, is it a viable option for the recreational market or only viable for strictly medical purposes? Uh, what's your expert opinion on that? <laughs> uh, I certainly think that there's a business case to grow uh, can't wreck cannabis indoors. The reason I say that is 
Um, there, there, there certainly is a high taxation uh, in Canada as compared to other jurisdictions. 54 cents of every retail dollar is going to one level of government or another through various taxes. Is that all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, regulatory fees and uh, wholesale markups. Um, but the consumer cares about quality. And, uh, you know, I think there's two segments. It's cheap molecules at the lowest price. And then there's people who care about quality cannabis and are willing to pay for it. There's a, it's a bifurcated market. You just need to be in that quality end. Uh, so don't just grow great quality. You got to finish it with and preserve that quality as well. All right. So this question is from Cantic and um, Lucky you spoke about validation of data. How did you solve the equipment problem for validation? Uh, buy a lot of sensors uh, that operate on different principles. Uh, and, uh, and so that way you can account. So if, you're, if you've got a thermometer, consider infrared, consider, uh, you know, uh, you know a, a traditional, you know, mercury or alcohol thermometer, consider zero mass thermal probes and uh, take those measurements multiple different ways, understand what your variance is with the limitations on the precision of your devices and, and what kind of biases are out there. So have, don't rely on one piece of equipment and validate all of your equipment against uh, uh, each other. All right, so a uh, follow-up question regarding validation. Uh, regarding the validation of instruments of methods, especially with a thermal imaging example, did you find a commercial product that was uh, fit for this purpose? Uh, we've not solved the reflectance issue. Um, you know, we, we um, you know, essentially the colas show up really hot, uh, you know, and that gave us some concern, uh, you know, when we started looking at the data. Um, you know, I think there is an elevated temperature on those colas. They're just not transpiring as much. They've got more radiance than any other point of the plant. They're at the APC. Um, but uh, um, yeah, we, we haven't figured out how to get a true without sort of sticking as a zero mass thermal probe in the cola. Uh, and, but that's not like a, that's not a functional real time monitoring. That's more like just to come and, and validate uh, a measurement. So we just sort of know what the biases are at different stages and, and it's an educated um, guess. Okay, a two part question from uh, Jaron. Uh, what is the correct wind speed for the different stages of growth? And in terms of the source of the seedlings, is it better to get it from the, uh, the mother plants or from tissue culture? Uh, why don't you handle the second part and I'll kind of uh, try the first one there. Um, there's no uh, real uh, hard, fast rule on, on what that speed is, but it's generally accepted um, values for, for good airflow through a canopy. And this is, this is for all stages of growth, uh, is probably 0.3 to 0.5 meters per second. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, uh, the maintenance of germplasm as veg vegetative plants uh, is problematic. Uh, there's been some great articles that came out are talking about chimerism in donor stock of cannabis. So you are getting, uh, you know, you're getting mutations uh, in meristematic tissues on different branches. When you take a cutting from that donor stock plant, you're bringing that mutation with you. Um, you know, most of these are inconsequential. Some of these do relate, relate to things like secondary metabolite production. Um, particularly if you're using any, have, if you're using metal halide lighting and you have a source of UV in your donor stock room, that's a big problem. Uh, you will start to see budding, non-true to type. Um, it, that's on the genetic side. Uh, on the microbiological side, the longer you maintain plants in an ex vitro state, uh, the more likely they are to acquire a pathogen. Uh, fusarium is, um, I think, a big one that people don't really appreciate how prevalent and um, and what a detriment it is to your crop and productivity. Um, and I would say everyone has fusarium. I don't think any facility that I could find would not have it. Um, some, some genomes are pretty resistant. Some are not at all. Um, you know, just maintaining your donor stock in an outside environment, um, you know, powdery mildew is also another really pernicious problem. If you're trying to have stable production and you are committed to a supply chain where you got to deliver crops, you can't have crop failure. Uh, and, uh, and pathogens are the number one reason for crop failure. Uh, so I would definitely recommend 
using tissue culture um, as a way to redundantly store clean germ plasm and propagate at scale. Okay. Thank you. Stephanie Andrew has a two-part question on plant physiology relating to CO2. Can you recommend an optimum CO2 level for the flowering stage? And second is, can you reduce transpiration rate by rising or raising the CO2 concentration? Great question. Uh, yes, you can uh, adjust the ET rate, uh, uh, the transpirative rate uh, with CO2. Uh, we've used that as a technique um, we actually run a sealed environment, so we monitor the uh, gaseous CO2 in our environment, both what we're adding as well as what the plants are evolving during the respirative phase. Um, increasing CO2 will temporarily decrease uh, transpiration, but consider that the plant has an adaptive response to CO2. Pumping high CO2 early cycle will decrease your stomatic density and, and, um, and impair stomatic conductance. Uh, if you then try to uh, push higher VPD targets, but you don't have the stomata to support, uh, you know, the, the transpiration because all your leaves sensed all this high CO2 concentration and didn't, didn't build enough stomata uh, to support the dissipation of heat when you bump your lighting up, uh, that can be quite problematic. So start low with your CO2 um, and, and crank it up, but it's really kind of proportional to all of your other factors. If you're not pushing more than 750 uh, PPFD, you probably don't need to go over a thousand, uh, you know, but if you're pushing 2000 PPFD, 60 DLI, uh, yeah, you, you're, you're going to want to crank that CO2 up so long as you can manage your root zone and nutrition as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, back to Philippe. Uh, could you use leaf reflectance with IR of 700 to 2000 nanometers, for instance, as a proxy for measuring ET and informed lighting intensity and other feedbacks? Yeah, theoretically, I, I think that's possible. Yep. Okay. I have to give that some uh, thought. <laughs> How to make that happen? But yeah, I see. I see the principle you're you're thinking of. Okay. Uh, another question from him is: uh, What about berry growing in a vertical farm slash CA CA system, as per drawing on webinar title page? <laughs> I'm yeah. Not sure, I don't. Uh, I, I'm going to say the, uh, the, the, the Ample platform uh, was we designed it specifically so that you can grow higher order plants and uh, berry production. Um, the type that you see there, as well as general raspberries, strawberries, um, would, uh, would easily be um, supported in, in this platform. Um, and again, some of the features that are in there um, would make it very um, um, easy to maintain. So you don't have to reach in, you can pull things out. Um, we can change the uh, design so that you have different air flows, you have different heights. Our layer heights can change from essentially uh, two and a half feet to uh, six feet if, if you want. Um, uh, there's no reason we can't do that. It just requires uh, a little bit of engineering and redesigning some of the components. A quick follow-up to Emil from Philip again. Uh, was that 1500K, I suppose that's Kelvin, plus deep red on one channel? Uh, it, it, it can be, it was actually 5,000 5, Kelvin, um, cool white, um, and uh, deep red at 660 uh, nanometers. And that is, uh, we can make it in one channel or give you the agency to adjust uh, the red uh, uh, and give that extra pop at different uh, stages of growth. I think we've covered all the questions, but I've got a question. So there's so many varieties of um, cannabis uh, and, and with this precision uh, type of uh, vertical farm slash production system that you have, how did you go about selecting uh, the appropriate uh, variety for that particular system? I know that this has to do as well with customer preference or demand, but Tell us about it. How the process that you uh, you de decided to uh, to use? Well, uh, if you have a scalable propagation platform, um, you know, and you can plant at very high densities, the ideal um, morpho morphological characteristics would be an apically dominant short internode um, space uh, cultivar. Now. Uh, if you've worked with cannabis and, and grown it under some very different conditions, there's a lot of plasticity within a genome. Um, you, you know, uh, 
you know, some plants that we source from other licensed producers look completely different uh, in grown in a different environment. You know, so there's a lot of agency to work with uh, germplasm that you may have. Um, but, you know, I would suggest that if, if your goal is to produce uniformity and, and push efficiency, then you're looking for um, short flowering periods, apically dominant sort of one central cola that really facilitates processing branchy and um, big inner node, um, non-apically dominant long flowering cycles, just kind of defeating the purpose of, of, of doing a vertical farm. If that's the case, just one layer of production if you plan to grow a uh, large plant. Um, you know, so um, yeah, I, I would say that mo most germplasm can work in a setup like this. There's probably a few that don't fit. Great, yes. So we have about four minutes left and I'd like to uh, give uh, an opportunity to both of you uh, to give us some parting words. Uh, I think we learned a lot in this uh, session here and you've been parted really uh, quite a bit in terms of the uh, precision uh, approach uh, to uh, vertical farming and or farming for cannabis, translatable for food crop production. So uh, give us your parting words on this. <laughs> How do you crystallize everything? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, as an entrepreneur, um, you know, my recommendation for folks would be uh, don't, don't be daunted by the, the challenge. Um, it's never been, there's never been a better time when you look at the development of uh, technologies, uh, their appropriateness for use cases, uh, all the resources that are out there, the knowledge that's being generated, um, you know, it is, it is something that is accessible and somebody can learn up and, and figure some of this stuff out. I mean, before I met Emil, you know, we wanted to find a vertical farming system that we thought would scale and work. And we started a, a, a prototyping and it was rough and dirty, uh, you know, but we were able to validate insights that the rest of industry had missed not because we're brilliant folks. I, I love my team. There are some brilliant folks on the team, but there are brilliant folks and hardworking folks and educated folks everywhere. Uh, you know, it's, it, uh, you know, so I, I, it has never been a better time to be an innovator with a, the amount of technology that's available out there and knowledge and the accessibility of that knowledge. Um, you can figure it out, so give it a try. Yeah. Well said, Buck. Um, I guess uh, from, from my perspective, as, as the topic related to managing airflow, um, if there's one takeaway people can, can get from this is that you have to build in the agency to get air into the inner canopy and get it back out once it's picked up all of the byproducts of photosynthesis. Um, and um, if you don't build in mechanisms for adjusting and balancing airflow down a long length, you are going to have a problem. Uh, there's just no way around it. It's just the physics of moving air. And um, make sure you can control your uh, run down the length. Um, if, it, if you don't have it, you're going to have problems. Mm -hmm. All right. Emil, one quick question. Uh, the uh, design configurations that you shared with us, is that proprietary or is that uh, open to the public? Um, so some of it is, is open now. We're still working on a, a, a couple of um, uh, portions there. We've got some patent pending things, but uh, if anyone needs, uh, if they, if they want to funnel questions through you, uh, I'll be happy to share what we can share and glad, glad to do it. Okay. And with that, uh, Bak Hyang and Emil Breza, thank you so much for imparting to us the crucial lessons you've learned in your industry, that your wisdom has been quite valuable. Uh, and I'd like to thank, uh, of course, all of our attendees. And um, I'd like to thank again, on behalf of the Association for Vertical Farming, uh, your attendance today. Uh, with Christine and, and Ramin and the whole ABF team, we thank all of you. Thank you very thank you. much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye now.